Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew 11 and 28, and while you're looking it up, or probably not because you're looking at the Sky Bible behind me, uh, just you want to be here at 8.30 or 10 Sunday because that, that first message of the, the new series Pastor Jared started shifted. Wasn't that amazing? Amen. Amen. That, that, was, a, that was a bedrock message. Uh, if you didn't hear that message when the foundations are destroyed, I encourage you go back and listen to that catch up before Sunday and then come expecting. Uh, I, I can't wait for more already. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because we still have tonight. So, so let's get into the word. Matthew 11, 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. 1 John 1 and 8 says, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. And it's like, wow, what a, what a powerful start already. It's like, welcome to Point Church, you sinner. <laughs> but that's where we're going to go tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Pray you'd speak to us in a very real way. Speak to us clearly tonight, God, even if it hurts. I pray that you would let your, your truth be revealed in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. amen. And you can, uh, you can be seated. I want to talk to you on this subject. Become the good tree. Become the good tree. Uh, sin is the root reason that many Christians do not enjoy the freedom, purpose, and peace that God intends. And so tonight, we're going to talk about sin. And, and this is one of those lessons that if you have a notebook and pen, you probably want to take it out because we're going to talk about a lot of stuff uh, really quick. And like I, I, I say sometimes, you have about a 90% better chance of getting to heaven if you take notes. So uh, you, you probably want to want to do that uh, and go back and look at them later. So uh, I know that typically when we discuss sin, our, our typical Christian default is to immediately start thinking about everybody else's. You know, it's like, I, I'm glad someone's finally going to address her attitude or, or his pride or her unfaithfulness or his lack of commitment. It's like, yeah, buddy, we're going to talk about sin. It's like, sick him, sick him. But I'm just going to tell you from the beginning that God wants to talk to you. Look at the person next to you and just tell them, go ahead and point at them. God wants to talk to you. And, and just because you need to do it, just go ahead and kind of point back at yourself and, and say, he's talking to, to me. He's talking to me. And, and let me just say from the beginning, I'm going to kind of get deep with sin, but I, I, I don't want to just talk about the problem without giving a solution. There is a remedy, and his name is Jesus. Okay. You didn't know it, but last week we strategically talked about grace before we talked about sin because we wanted you to see the power of grace before we talk about the reach of sin. And if you didn't hear that sermon, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. What, what, powerful, what powerful stuff. Didn't Sister Corey do a great job last week? It's like the, the Grand Canyon. I could never cross that divide that sin created, but grace carries me across Grace is the bridge between who I am and who God's called me to be. I can get there by grace. I'm, I'm thankful for that. I want to tell you tonight, no matter what you're facing right now in this moment, Jesus is the answer and his grace is enough. His grace is enough. Now, with that said, my focus and my mission tonight is to explore the concept of sin. And it's not a fun topic, but we're, we're going to get there anyway. So, some of this is going to be very basic, but, but let's just talk about it. A quick rundown of sin. There's what we call universal sin, and that's Adam sinned. And so now all of us take on a sinful, fleshly, carnal nature. And here's a little truth bomb for you is that you're not a sinner because you commit sin. No, you're, you, you commit sin because by nature you are a sinner. And, and it's important that we understand that because if we could ever really admit that about ourselves, it should strengthen our resolve to really get connected and stay connected to Jesus because without him, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I'm nothing without him. It, it should make us want to pursue holiness and, and build as big a wall as possible so we don't fall and falter because without him, I'm a sinner. That's, that's who I am. And so we see that, that there is... 
the universal sin, but then there's also personal sin. And personal sin are sins that I personally commit myself. And under this category, there's what we call sins of commission, which is the things that I do that I should not do. And that, that makes sense. But then watch this. James has to throw a whole wrench in the plan in James 4.17 when he says, Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. So there's sins of commission, and then we see there's also sins of, of omission, things that I know I should be doing that I'm not doing. And you know the, the kind of good stuff that we just kind of leave undone sometime, like, like kind of like the prayer and, and fasting and like reading the word and like loving others and pointing people to Jesus, like, like giving sacrificially and considering others before myself. You know, just the, just the small, unimportant stuff is what I'm talking about here. So if, if we're going to talk about sin, let's, let's define sin. Sin is, number one, doing things my way instead of God's way. It's being led away by my own desires or wants, even when or if I attribute those desires to God. It, it's like there's this strange thing happening in Christianity. I don't know if you've noticed it, but it's, it, it's like if I want something bad enough, all of a sudden it becomes God's will. <laughs> have, you, have you noticed that? It's, it's like kind of crazy, but, but, but it happens. Sometimes we forget that the enemy is a master manipulator, a master deceiver, and he gets all up in our emotions. Uh, that's why we have to know that everything you feel is not real. The Bible says you can't trust your emotions to set your path correctly because following your own desires usually leads to destruction if you veer from the path that God has set for you. So sin is going my way instead of God's way. And number two, sin is depending on anyone or anything more than I depend on God. That's sin. Sin is any perversion, number three, something that God intended to be good, but I've twisted it and it can become evil if it goes against God's original plan. That, that's number three. Number four, sin is anything that causes separation between me and God. Any focus on I more than him or any focus on my will more than his will. And so here are two very powerful correlating truths that, that we should understand is, first of all, thinking of yourself first always leads to sin. It happened with Lucifer uh, from the very beginning. I will exalt my throne above God and it caused his fall. Eve in the Garden of Eden, same thing. She saw the tree that it was good for her and decided she wanted to partake of it and it led to sin. So thinking of yourself first will always lead to sin. Here's the second correlating truth is that you will sin less if you prioritize God and others more. That's, that was pretty good. You will sin less if you prioritize God and others more. That's why Jesus said that the, 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 the two laws is serve God and, and serve others. Love God and love others. If we do that, we fulfill the law. And then we learn that sin is rebelling against God's word by the way that I live. My life going against God's word, that is sin. And as Christians, th this isn't something we don't already know. I'm just building a foundation. But as Christians, we measure everything according to the word of God. God's word settles every issue for us, right? God's word's the ultimate authority. It's forever settled. It settles everything, not my opinion, not my preferences, not the world standards or the world's philosophies, not the trend of current culture. No, we as Christians stick with the word of God because his word is truth. And we talked a couple of weeks ago that one major problem in Christianity is that Christians focus too much on behavior modification without really dealing with the root of the issue. And I want to show you why this is important, why behavior modification isn't enough. So there's typically three different levels of sin. There's the heart level, the level of our emotions or, or where we feel, and then there's the actions that correspond. So there's the heart level or, or the root, there's the feeling level, the emotions, and then there's the action level. And, and let me try to explain this in a way that makes sense. So let's say that at the heart level, I have some bitterness or unforgiveness towards someone in my heart. And so on the emotional level or on the feeling level, I start feeling anger or hatred toward this person. 
And so on the action level, that leads to murder. Everybody with me so far? And you're like, no. I would never do that. I know because we're too Christian. We would never kill anybody. So let's, let's backtrack and rewind and try it again. So let's say on the heart level, I have bitterness or unforgiveness. And so on the emotion level, that leads to anger or, or hatred. But I'm, I'm too Christian for hatred. So let's just say a strong dislike. I have a strong dislike for this person now. That's more acceptable. And, and so now that leads to the action level of I punch them in the nose. And you're still looking at me like I'm crazy. Like, no, that's still too much, okay? So let's backtrack again. And so I have this bitterness and this unforgiveness in my heart, and that leads to anger or strong dislike. And now I cuss them out under my breath. Now, now we're getting a little bit closer to, to home. Still too much, though, so let's backtrack one more time. And I have this bitterness and unforgiveness that leads to the strong dislike on the inside, and so I gossip about them behind their back because I think everyone else should know how bad of a person they really are. And so a lot of times what we do as Christians is we start feeling convicted about that. And so then we start trying to fix the action. Well, if I can not stop talking about them or cussing them out under my breath or, or if I can hold back the punch that I really want to give them. Maybe I can even control my emotions some, and I won't feel as angry. I'll turn my hatred to dislike and, 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 and kind of modify some, some emotions there. But we never get to the heart or the root of the issue. And as long as we're not dealing with the root of the issue, we're continual, continually cycle over and over again. And, 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 and watch this. Jesus addressed this type of, of subject. You want a hardcore read on the way that Christians should behave, I challenge you to read Luke chapter 6. Jesus gives this very convicting summary, and in Luke chapter 6, he talks about a lot of stuff. He talks about humility. He talks about loving others unconditionally. He talks about being willing to forgive. He talks about living the word of God, applying it to your life. He talks about patience, not seeking vengeance when others have done you wrong. He talks about not retaliating in anger. He talks about sacrificial giving. He talks about going the extra mile for those that you don't think deserve anything from you. He talks about loving your enemies. He talks about lending, but then not demanding more back from the person than what they borrowed. He talks about not being judgmental, but showing grace. He talks about speaking positive instead of speaking negative. I mean, that's a pretty exhaustive list for one message, right? I'm tired just telling you about it. it, it it's a pretty exhaustive list. But then toward the end of that dissertation, Jesus says this in Luke chapter 6, verse 43 through 45. He says, a good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes, and grapes are never picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. This is incredible because Jesus goes through that long list of things that we should and we shouldn't do and how we should act and how we shouldn't act. And then he summarizes that long list like this. He says, okay, guys, listen up. I'm not telling you all of these things so that you can just try to change the behaviors that I've mentioned. No, Jesus concluded by saying this lesson is not about modifying behaviors or controlling your emotions. He says, listen, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit no matter how much you spruce it up. It's not about trying to look like a good tree. It's not about planting yourself in a forest of good trees so maybe you can be guilty of goodness by association. Like, that's kind of what we try to do. We come to church, and I'm, I'm guilty of goodness by association. But, but Jesus said, no, no, the Christian life is about becoming the good tree. It's about walking with me and letting me transform you from the inside out. And when you become the healthy tree, healthy fruit will be produced. Jesus was saying, if you want true freedom and peace and joy and contentment, all of that stuff is naturally produced when you become the good tree. Become the good tree. Romans 6, Romans 8 and 6, just taking this a little deeper, he says, 
Let your sinful nature control your minds. Letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. The Bible creates this, this idea that there is something within you, within your flesh, that is always conspiring against what God has for you. Your flesh is always conspiring against the will of God for your life. And that's why we have to commit to reading the word of God daily. And we have to commit to fasting often. And we have to commit to, to daily prayer. And, and it's like somebody like, what? Like, pray daily? Like, you got to be kidding. I'm not that spiritual. I know. <laughs> You're getting it. That's, that's what I'm saying. We don't pray because we're spiritual. We pray because we're carnal and we desperately need to be connected to Jesus. We don't pray because we're spiritual. We pray because we need God's grace operating and moving in our life. We don't pray because we're spiritual. We, we pray because we're carnal and we desperately need him to order our steps and show us what we should be doing and not be doing on any given day. We need to become the good tree. That's, that's why I pray. I want to be the good tree. I want to be the good tree. And I mentioned it earlier. That's why we have to stick with the word of God as our absolute authority. If the Bible calls something sin, it's, it's sin. It's sin. And this is important because there's a lot of what the Bible calls sin that modern worldly culture is trying to normalize. Things like homosexuality, the murder of unborn children, changing the very nature of who God created you to be, and even less obvious things if we take a, take a step back like like sex before marriage becoming normal, drunkenness becoming normal, just to name a few. But, but the world can't normalize what the Bible has called sin. It, 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 it can't do it. And that's why we stick with the word of God, because what the Bible calls sin, it doesn't matter what the modern worldly culture has tried to normalize, it's still sin. And, and sometimes when we talk about sin, we like to talk about that, but but I want you to hear me tonight because there's a lot of what the Bible calls sin that modern church culture has begun to normalize as well. And uh oh, maybe we're getting a little bit closer to home. We can amen when we talk about all that other stuff. But when we start getting to this stuff, it's like it gets tight. That's all right. Things like anxiety constantly and, and constant fear that's always gripping my mind. And I can't move because I'm so afraid of of doing anything and the Bible says be anxious of nothing and all things give thanks supplication before the Lord it's it's like the, the self-righteousness that sometimes we can get as as Christians or this hyper spirituality where you know God uses me because I'm more worthy and I'm more spiritual than than someone else bitterness gossip apathy concerning eternity or apathy concerning the kingdom it doesn't really matter because I'm too busy or just outright laziness, excessive materialism, coveting, negativity, complaining, rebellious attitudes toward authority, bad argumentative attitudes toward others. It's like the list could go on and on, but I'm going to tell you what the Bible is called sin. It doesn't matter if the world's normalizing it or the church is normalizing it. Sin is sin. And I have to tell you, the enemy wants us to believe, oh, well, that's just the way I am. It's just me. But just because I've behaved some way for so long that it's become my disposition doesn't mean that it's not despicable in God's eyes. The Bible doesn't afford me the opportunity to say, well, it's just who I am. The Bible says that freedom and contentment are contingent upon me becoming the good tree. So imagine this, if you will, my, my car breaks down, the engine's destroyed, and the mechanic comes out and he's like, well, Jonathan, how often did you check the oil? I'm like, every day. But there's no oil in it. There's no leaks and there's no oil. Well, I checked it yesterday, I'm telling you. Well, where did you check it? In my wife's car. It's a little low. She told her she needs to put more in it. Matter of fact, when you weren't looking, I checked your car too. And I think yours is a little bit lower than mine. So, so you should check it. Okay, but did you ever think to check your, the oil in your own car? Um, no. Pretty crazy, huh? 
Yeah, funny too, yeah. <laughs> As Christians, we need to learn to evaluate our own weaknesses and our propensity to sin before we judge other people. And I'm going to tell you this is so important because the enemy can't tempt you to sin by using something that does not naturally attract you. James 1 and 14 says, temptation comes from your own desires, which entice us and drag us away. The Bible's trying to get us to understand that if we can recognize our own triggers, then it becomes easier to resist the temptation when I understand the attack. If I can value, evaluate my own weaknesses and fortify myself against them and pray against them and work against them, then I'm going to be less likely to live a sinful life. And if sin comes from my own desires, then I have to stop saying that I'm standing against sin when I'm only standing against everyone else's. And I'm not evaluating the integrity of my own heart. I know I'm throwing a lot at you tonight. Let me show you, and I'm going to try to be blunt so I can be, but be practical because I really want to be clear with this. It's like, I may not be tempted with homosexuality, but if I'm constantly viewing pornography, I need to stop talking about how despicable people are who live an alternative lifestyle, and I need to fight my own battle first. Get an accountability partner, download some apps, get in a group that'll help you overcome it, stop excusing it and, and believing it's acceptable because I feel God on Sunday, it's, I need to check the oil in my car. I may hate the liberal agenda of Starbucks and Target and Disney, but I shouldn't boycott liberal companies while ignoring the fact that I cuss like a sailor, isolate people with my attitude, and fail to represent Jesus when I'm not in this building. I'm waiting for the eggs or tomatoes. I may hate abortion, but I shouldn't pig it and argue with everyone if I'm allowing anger and my negative attitude to control my emotional well-being. I need to conquer my own enemy first because it could be those things that I'm allowing in my own life that is keeping me from being free and from living in the freedom that God wants me to live in. And understand my heartbeat tonight. I'm, I'm not saying that it's wrong to fight the big battles. What I'm saying is that it's pointless to struggle against the big battles and not fight the issues in my own flesh, the struggle that's arising from my own humanity, I have to deal with me. I have to deal with me. The truth is I cannot allow personal sin to flourish in my life and expect the power of God to operate and the blessings of God to freely flow. True freedom comes when I learn to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5 and 16 says it this way. The King James Version says, Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 and 16 says, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Become the good tree, and you'll get good fruit. Watch how Paul continues this, because this is a pretty incredible text that's often misinterpreted. I don't want you to misinterpret it. We're going to start at 16 again. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Watch this. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite than what the spirit, sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you're directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Now, People try to say that means that grace completely obliterates our requirements to live normally, like there's, there's no legality anymore. Because of grace, all the laws no longer apply. Hopefully, we just kind of choose to live good lives, but if we don't, grace covers us. That's the interpretation many people give from this text. You've been saved, so if you mess up and you stop living a holy life, it's okay. Grace has got your back. kind of takes the pressure off. It's almost like it's, it's okay to sin, you know, if... If I just can't help it, <laughs> it's kind of okay. <laughs> but then Paul clears that up in the next verse. He says, that's not what I'm talking about at all. He, he's talking to born-again Christians, and watch what he tells them. In verse 19, he says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, 
jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Watch this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul, Paul's like, like, yo, I'm repeating myself to be clear. Like, like, listen up, pay attention, because I've told you this before. He's letting them know, I've told you this many times before, and I'm going to tell you again, you need to get this. Anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sin will separate you from God. You cannot be saved and live in sin. And some people say that, that, like I said, grace means that you have no legal requirements. But Paul said, I'm reminding you that you have to live God's way if you want to be saved. Um, that's... That's legal, that's legal requirements. But then Paul continues in verse 22, and I, I love this. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yeah, you had to be there. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut. That's something I've learned over the past few weeks. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Notice the vast contrast to the list that he presented earlier. He lists all of these good things, and then he concludes with this. There is no law against these things. This is a very powerful statement by Paul. It's a direct reference back to you're no longer under the obligation of the law of Moses. It's an emphatic announcement that these things meet all the requirements of the law. That's what he was saying is if you walk in the spirit, yes, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses anymore because out of you is going to begin to flow all kind of things that begin to meet the requirements of the law. You don't have to dot every I and cross every T because naturally the fruit of the spirit is when you become the good tree. Become the good tree. It's, it's what Paul was saying. It's what Jesus was saying. Become the good tree. Stop striving to... To, to do everything right. Stop, stop fighting to, to get everything, all, all the ducks, the spiritual ducks in a row. Stop working so hard in your flesh. That's what they were saying is, if you'll just become the good tree, if you'll just get connected back to our original text, if you'll just come to me and yoke with me and learn of me, you'll get these things. Become the good tree and if sin is so deceptive, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up pretty soon. If sin is so deceptive, then how can we know? I'm going to put three slides up real quick. This just kind of a way that you can tell, because Jesus kind of answered that for us. said from the inside, stuff comes out, and that's how you know. It's like the law is there to be a revealer, to know if you're good or bad kind of thing. So, so to know if you're the good tree or, the, or not the good tree. And the first is my thought life. So examine my thought life. Is, is there doubt and unbelief, or is there faith? Is there fear or is there trust? Am I unforgiving toward others or forgiving? Do unclean, lustful thoughts rest in my mind or are there pure thoughts? Am I greedy, covetous, and jealous or do I rejoice and genuinely happy when others succeed? Am I proud and arrogant or am I humble? Am I ungrateful or thankful? Am I selfish? Am I selfless? Am I deceitful or am I honest? Am I rebellious or submissive, judgmental or merciful? And I can't answer that for you because that's your head, not mine. But examine your thoughts and see, am I, am I a good tree? Sinful behavior versus spirit-filled behavior is my actions. Am I stubborn or am I submitted? Am I living in fornication and adultery or unnatural and healthy affections or do I have a pure heart? Am I drunkenness or, or drug addiction or do I walk in sobriety? Is there brutality and aggressiveness or brotherly kindness and peacefulness with all men? Do I lack self-control? Or am I disciplined in my living? Am I stealing all the time or am I honest? Am I disobedient or am I obedient? Am I attention seeking or do I point people to Jesus and that's the attention I'm trying to create? Am I abusive in my relationships with others or am I loving? Excessive materialism versus moderation. And then how do I talk? My speech. Sinful speech versus spirit-filled speech is do I find myself lying or... Am I honest in my speech? Here's a good one. Am I always complaining or am I thankful? Am I yelling at others when I get upset, especially family and close friends? Or am I gentle in my speech? Am I boasting or am I humble? 
Am I gossiping about others or am I edifying? Am I disputing and argumentative or am I peaceful? Cussing or clean speech? Cursing negative toward others? Speaking death, the Bible calls it, or do I speak life? I'm positive toward others in situations. Jesus, this is kind of like a list that he gave them. And that's the reason I wanted you to see it because it makes you think. And it's kind of the list that Jesus gave them. And then Jesus said, if we're not careful, what we do is say, well, I need to have less fear and more trust. And so what can I do to get more trust? Or I need to, to clean my thoughts up. So what can I do to think more pure thoughts? And Jesus said, when you go with that approach, you're doing it wrong. If you really want to overcome sin, Jesus said it's, it's really as simple as become the good tree. Become the good tree. And and I'm closing with this, and I know I talked a lot about sin tonight. I know it's deep. I know it, it's, it's been challenging to the flesh. It's never fun when we challenge ourselves, but, but it's sometimes necessary. And I want to give you the counter to sin to close out. We talked about it last week, but I'm going to mention it again right here. Romans 5 and 20 says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass. Powerful verse. The law came to make the trespass more clear so that we can more clearly see how wrong, sinful we really are. Thank God Paul didn't put his pen down in that moment. Puts a comma and says, but where sin increased, I know we talked about sin a lot, and you're probably thinking, man, I'm a horrible person. That's okay. I am too. All of us are deep down on the inside. But the good news is that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, we read it earlier, says, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But Again, I'm thankful that the author didn't stop there. He, he continues, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And I close as we all stand together with this. Colossians 1 and 11, it says, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power. So with you will have all endurance and patience that you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Watch this. Who purchased our freedom. And forgave our sins. You want to walk in freedom. He already purchased our freedom for us. I just need to become the good tree. So that his fruit will begin to manifest itself in my life. I've come to tell somebody tonight. Stop settling for less than the freedom that God's faithfulness has already provided for you. Don't settle for fear when you can walk in faith. Don't settle for survival when you can walk in favor. Don't settle for emptiness when you can walk in anointing. Don't, don't settle for less than what God is trying to place in your life. Stop settling. As we all lift our hands right now, I want to pray for you. Father, in, the, in your precious name, God, I pray that you would move on us in a great way, Jesus. Help us, God, understand that without you, we are nothing, God, but with you, Jesus. Your grace is enough. Your grace is powerful enough to cover our mistakes and our failures and our faults and our flaws, God. Examine me. Create within me a clean heart. Search me and know me, oh God. Let me be the good tree that good fruit comes from. In Jesus' name. I'll tell you what, why don't we just gather as a family and let's just thank God for his word. Examine yourself. Let's just come and, and worship him for just a moment. Thank you, Jesus.
Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.